Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining um, to another MBMG Montana Tech uh, seminar. Uh, this week's speaker guest is Dr. Rob Thomas, Regents Professor um, of Environmental Sciences at the University of Montana Western. Uh, and he's going to be giving us a talk on the latest edition of the Roadside Geology of Montana. Um, one thing I wanted to just say before we get started is, is someone who's lived and worked as a geologist in multiple states, it's always nice to have these roadside geology resources to get adjusted to each new state and uh, this book is no exception. Um, so without uh, any more time, I'd like to hand it over to Rob. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for participating. Uh, I'll uh, try to move rapidly through this. We only have 4 billion years of Earth history to cover in 50 minutes. So a uh, little background on roadside geology of Montana. Uh, many of you who are fans of the roadside geology series recognize that uh, roadside geology started with the uh, roadside geology of the Northern Rocky uh, Mountains uh, book in 1972. Jim, why don't you go to that next that next slide, if you would? Um, there it is on the right. Three dollars and ninety five cents, uh, <laughs> and uh, yep, it, it costs a little bit more. That's Dave out there on the left, and uh, the whole roadside geology series was the brainchild of Dave Alt and Don Hyman at the University of Montana in Missoula, and uh, they had been. You know, running field trips and uh, you know, got the idea, as far as I can tell from Don, uh, kind of collectively the idea of generating uh, a book that would be a series of road guides uh, for students to, or for people to explore the geology of uh, the Northern Rocky Mountains. And so they created this book. It's a, you know, a famous book with its red uh, binding on it, and uh, if you see one uh, at a at a uh, yard sale or at a bookstore, snag it because uh, at least amongst uh, the us geologists, it's a um, you know it's a rare a rare book, if you will, <laughs> an important book worth having in your collection. Uh, my interest in uh, roadside goes way back. Uh, I've always been interested in roadside geology books. Uh, my mother um, was a fan of the roadside books and I always felt like Don and Dave really had made one of the great contributions to uh, bringing geology to the public. And uh, in fact, GSA, the Geological Society of America has an award uh, for people that um, make contributions to public education and geology. And I've often felt that uh, that award needs to go to Don Hyman as the surviving um, uh, originator of the book. And I've actually put it in myself uh, several times before without it happening um, uh, at GSA. So uh, log that one away someplace. We need to get Don Hyman this award um, because uh, I can't think of really many other uh, public service contributions in geology more important than roadside geology. Um, so I got involved with this book uh, because I had, in part because I had done a book. Um, I think, my, yeah, my screen is still being shared. So I started with this roadside geology of Yellowstone country. And uh, uh, I got a con I was contacted by Bill Fritz, who was the original author of Roadside Geology of Yellowstone Country. And Bill uh, said, uh, hey, he said, uh, they're gonna get rid of my book. Uh, you know, would you help me to update it um, so we can keep it in the series? It, it, it ought to only take about three months. <laughs> well, three years later, Roadside Geology of Yellowstone Country uh, was written. And uh, that led to uh, this, uh, Roadside Geology of Montana. Um, Dave Alt had passed away. I was over at the um, gathering on the UM campus uh, following his passing. 
And Don Hyman and I started talking and uh, we thought, you know, we were, we were talking about roadside geology and he was clearly kind of hinting around. And uh, about a week later, I got an email and uh, he asked me to uh, participate with him in redoing roadside geology of Montana. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, I am the least likely candidate to have worked with Don on this. Uh, when I applied for grad school in Missoula, uh, I don't know, there was probably 25 people admitted into the program that year. I was the last uh, admitted because my GRE scores were so bad that Don thought I was illiterate. And uh, so it was Don Winston uh, at the university that finally talked Don Heinemann into letting me in, even though I had terrible GRE scores and was illiterate. And uh, so when Heinemann asked me to, to participate in this book, it was like, no way. Uh, you know, it just, uh, the irony uh, was incredible. And uh, uh, so anyway, here we are. Uh, and with the help of Chelsea Feeney, who might be out there in cyber world listening to this, uh, who did the illustrations, you know, we came up with this beautiful looking book, which, uh, you know, is uh, in no small measure, uh, you know, uh, the responsibility of Chelsea as well as Don and I. Okay, next slide, please. So Montana is a big state. And uh, I was going to play highway to hell, but I don't control the uh, <laughs> I don't control the PowerPoint. Um, so boom, there goes my highway to hell. Uh, but it's the highway to hell. I have been from Yak to Alzada. Alzada's down there in the lower right corner of the state, and Yak is up in the upper left corner, not even on the map. For those that know Yak, you can get a Yak attack in Yak, or at least you used to be able to. That's a hamburger and uh, cheeseburger actually, uh, I think probably with bacon. And uh, so one of the great things about doing a book like this is just getting to know your state. Yeah, you know, I've literally like Hank Snow once wrote, I've been everywhere. And uh, so uh, I really have a sense for Montana as a result of the book. Okay, Jim. All right, so what's in a roadside geology book? Well, this beautiful stuff, courtesy Chelsea Feeney. Uh, maps, cross sections, and graphics, uh, as well as, you know, the photography from Don and I, as well as, uh, you know, um, our friends out there. Marley Miller is a major contributor to uh, photography in the book, for example. Um, I'm for what's best, not what's mine. <laughs> and so uh, if somebody's got a better photo than I do, I, I'm more than happy to pirate it. Uh, the maps, uh, as you can see, uh, are uh, their bureau maps that we modified, and uh, the cross sections are developed by Don and I uh, as well, and and some modified from other sources, like the uh, one of uh, Glacier on on the you know, upper right, and uh, and you know, last but not least. This is a summary book of other people's work. And so, uh, you know, the myriad of uh, authors of research on Montana geology are really responsible uh, for the book. And so a graphic like the one in the lower right of the Belt C comes from the one and only Don Winston. God damn. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Chelsea making it look nice. Uh, it's that kind of information from our colleagues, uh, for Don and I, that make this, you know, the roadside book possible. Jim? Okay, so with that, uh, let's go screaming through the geological history of Montana. Uh, I'll try to you know, thread the needle between the geologists and the non-geologists here with this. Um, and, and we'll start, of course, with what's the oldest stuff in the state. Well, uh, there are minerals that have been dated in quartzites in the Beartooth. Uh, the Beartooth Plateau, which is on your left, uh, that's the Beartooth Highway out of Red Lodge. 
um, at uh, the Vista up there off the, uh, off the road and a nice view up Rock Creek Valley and it's beautiful U shape and the nice planar top to the Beartooth. And those rocks um, are primarily Archean in age and belong to the Wyoming province. And there's some zircons in there that have 4 billion year dates on them. So those are the oldest dated materials in the state of Montana. Uh, most of the rock is granitic gneiss um, and is a part of the old craton, the Wyoming craton, part of the old core of North America, Laurentia. Um, and uh, tacked onto it are some slightly younger, but still Archean rocks that are some of the most important and spectacular in the world, the, the Stillwater Complex, one of the few layered mafic intrusions of note uh, in the world. And uh, uh, the Stillwater Complex uh, dates to 2.7 billion years old. And uh, you know, that, that's a particular, uh, particularly spectacular shot on the right of the, the small scale uh, layering in this layered mafic intrusion. Uh, again, something that's very rare <clears throat> and uh, has a, a host of, of explanations for it, which I you know, range from everything from meteorite impacts to extension and, uh, and probably a few others. Uh, so I won't go into the details of those. Next, please. All right. So the first uh, uh, big orogenic event, in Montana, or mountain building event, non geos, occurs in later Keen and into Paleo Proterozoic time, mostly Paleo Proterozoic time. It's called the Big Sky Orogeny. And it is a ocean, it's an ocean basin closure between 1.9 and 1.7 billion years ago. Um, it's it, the suture is marked by a, a broad, ill-defined area loosely called the Great Falls Tectonic Zone. You can see it on the map in the lower left. I, sorry, I can't point to it, but it's uh, that purple area. And uh, what it is, it's the suture zone between the pink area, which is called the Medicine Hat Block, uh, which is a piece of Archean continental crust, and the area in gray, uh, uh, called the Wyoming Craton, uh, which is also uh, a piece of Archean uh, uh, continental crust. And so um, there was a subduction zone and the subduction zone uh, was bringing the medicine hat block towards the Wyoming Craton for an eventual continental to continental collision and suture. And uh, we actually have some igneous rocks. Uh, you can see there's an arrow pointing to the Little Belt Mountains on the map. Uh, there's some igneous rocks in the Little Belt Mountains that have recently been looked at as uh, possible subduction zone intrusions uh, associated with a subducting slab prior to the closure of this ocean and the continental to continental collision. You know, think for the non-geologists, think about India colliding with Asia to form the Himalayas um, so that you've got ocean floor preceding the continent of India in the collision of the continents. And same is going on here, uh, you know, about 1.8 billion years ago. And so there's some magma in the Little Belt Mountains, uh, some magmatic rocks, igneous rocks that might be related to the subduction zone. And uh, then uh, there's a metamorphic uh, signature in the rocks that are within the Great Falls tectonic zone. Uh, a spectacular, nice photograph of a nice over there on the right uh, on that slide. I was just there literally uh, 30, uh, 45 minutes ago with my students. <laughs> and uh, uh, there, it's part of a, you know, here in the Dillon area, part of a suite of rocks um, that are Paleoproterozoic to Archean in age uh, that are metasedimentary and were possibly passive margin sediments off of the Wyoming Craton that got crushed in the collision uh, and sutured on. So down here we've got marble and quartzite and stretch pebble conglomerates and a variety of, of Archean age rocks that are clearly metasedimentary. Uh, rocks and very well might have been part of uh, you know the 
sedimentary rocks along the edge of the continent at that time. So when we refer to rocks, you know, uh, these old rocks as the basement, we're doing them a disservice. Uh, there is an incredible history uh, to the quote basement uh, rocks and a uh, lot of work being done on it presently and uh, a tremendous story to be told. Um, and one of which uh, is this uh, big sky orogeny. Uh, again, the collision of the medicine hat block with the Wyoming craton growing the continent of North America at that time. Okay, Jim. All right. So in Mesoproterozoic time between 1.6 and 1.0 billion, uh, we, uh, this is a time of talc and mafic dikes and of course the belt base. Um, there's a supercontinent at that time, people refer to it as Nuna, it's also referred to as Columbia. Um, and uh, it begins to extend uh, around 1.5 billion years ago in what is today Montana. And that's the beginning of the formation of the Belt Basin. Um, some of the evidence we have for that, extent, that extension is the injection of diabase dikes, mafic dikes, dark dikes, the kinds of dikes that form when crust of the earth is pulled apart and it extends and you partially melt the mantle. Um, in the Dillon area, that uh, talc line you're looking at from the air photo, uh, there's a dike in the wall of that um, talc mine, and that dike dates to about 1.5 uh, billion years ago. And so is one of these uh, diabase dikes that's injected uh, at the time of rifting, if you will, or are pulling apart of the crust in, in Montana. Um, those faults that formed at that time, extensional faults are, are zones of porosity and permeability and hot water possibly associated with the diabase dike injections and hence the heat um, and carrying elements that are needed made talc. Uh, by intercepting dolostone um, in the Archean basement rocks, uh, metamorphosed dolostone, and then altering that along these faults to talc. Um, and so the talc deposits down here in Dillon at the Treasure Mine in the Ruby Range and the uh, Regal Mine, which is the picture you're looking at from the air. Uh, and that was a while back, uh, given the depth of the pit. Uh, that uh, that formed with the formation of the belt basin, the opening up the belt basin. So the belt basin, uh, we have belt rocks in and around the Dillon area. And as you go north, you cut, you cross a fault uh, that used to be called the Willow Creek Fault, it's now called the Jefferson Canyon Fault. Uh, and it's in that graphic in the upper right. And it separates the Dillon block, which is uh, the up block and exposes basement. Uh, meaning Archean uh, and Paleoproterozoic metamorphic rocks from the Belt Basin uh, to the north. And uh, debris flows of, uh, of Archean uh, rocks were shed and fluvial flows were shed into the Belt Basin off the Dillon Block. And you can see a picture uh, from the Jefferson uh, River Canyon, not too far from La Hood, Montana, of these spectacular debris flow deposits with uh, uh, Archean rock fragments. You can see the gneiss uh, there, uh, pencil per scale. And they're uh, you know, in a matrix supported um, in these debris flow deposits into the belt basin. And then from there north, it transitions into other kinds of belt rocks. Um, deposition began in the Belt Basin, it appears about 1.47 billion years ago and ended roughly about 1.40 uh, billion years ago. Um, the dates on the belt have uh, changed uh, more than I've changed clothing, I think, in my lifetime. Um, but uh, right now, uh, 1.47 to 1.40 is the going date range on the belt. And that's from Don Winston. And if you have a problem with that, you got to take it up with goddamn Don Winston. Okay, Jim. Thank you. Neoproterozoic. So as we go into the end of the Precambrian, uh, we 
that all topography that had previously been generated by that collision of the big sky orogeny and the extension and the uplift of the Dillon block and other blocks um, by extension that formed the Belt Basin, that is all eroded away for the most part um, by the Cambrian. Although recent research work that I've actually been doing with Paul Link at Idaho State shows that, uh, and, and uh, Mike Pope, who's a Texas A&M, Texas shows that the uh, passive margin in Montana in Cambrian time was not even remotely passive. Uh, <laughs> There actually is active uh, magnetism at that time. There's a pluton of Cambrian age down in the Beaverhead Mountains on the Montana-Idaho border uh, called the Beaverhead Pluton. And uh, it's absolutely Cambrian age. And uh, Paul Link and I were able to uh, do a study that uh, connected the uh, the grains of quartz off that pluton with uh, a Cambrian deposit called the Worm Creek Quartzite down in Idaho and Utah. And so uh, the take home is, is that we think about the Western margin of North America being a passive margin by half a billion years ago. And it, it's really, it's actually quite active um, and, uh, and there's magnetism, but that aside, um, it, uh, it, it is inundated with shallow ocean water. And that breakup that creates the Proto-Pacific or Paleo-Pacific Ocean uh, off to our west, present coordinates, is the breakup of the supercontinent of Rodinia about 780 million years. And uh, one of the uh, you know, very prominent markers of that extension event is the Purcell Sill in the park. And uh, the age of that sill is, again, something that's been confused uh, for a long time, uh, but uh, it is very demonstrably uh, neoproterozoic. Um, it, it has a date on it of about 780 MA or, or millions of million years, and, and it's part of the breakup of the so-called supercontinent of Rodinia. It's part of the extension that occurs uh, in Montana uh, in the Neoproterozoic, the end of the Precambrian, and the beginning of the Paleozoic. And then ocean water floods across that surface. And on the right, uh, that photo is that surface. Uh, some debate on that as well, like there is about everything, is the contact between the rock that my hammer is on and the one that my foot is standing on. That my foot is standing on the uh, Paleoproterozoic metamorphic rocks, nice. Um, and my hammer is touching the flathead sandstone, the basal Cambrian. And uh, uh, I personally think for reasons I won't go into in detail, that there's strong evidence to support that at this location, which is Camp Creek uh, nor, uh, in the Melrose area, uh, that uh, you can demonstrate it's a depositional contact between the flathead and the underlying uh, metamorphic rocks. In any case, it's the great unconformity, whether there's a fault there or not. And uh, that just means that it's a big period of time where there's no record. Um, and no record is as important as having a record. Um, it's telling us that something was going on there. And if we have no record, there was either uh, no deposition or there was erosion. And uh, so this is probably a big period of erosion uh, that uh, has eroded away the, uh, uh, the topography generated during the Precambrian, um, generating a surface by which then uh, the ocean floor transgressed uh, across the continent of North America, moving from west to east um, during what we call Cambrian time, uh, roughly 500 you know, or so million years ago. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so those early Paleozoic seas, you can see a graphic of it over to the right, uh, courtesy of Ron Blakey's beautiful paleogeographic maps. Uh, sea level rising across the continent of North America, creating a big, broad, uh, shallow sea uh, with just a little bit of, of uh, continent uh, land exposed at maximum transgression uh, called the transcontinental arch through the mid-continent of the United States. 
And uh, in those deposits that were laid down in that tropical shelf, you can see the equator um, with an arrow pointing north on it. Uh, that tropical water was filled with uh, an ex a quote explosion of life, right? The Cambrian explosion of life, trilobites and crinoids and hyolithids, which were a, a, an early mollusk, a clam-like thing. Uh, and I go on and on. Um, and of course, trilobites were my gig. I did my PhD on trilobite mass extinctions. Uh, with Jody Bourgeois at the University of Washington. And I got started on those working with Don Winston at the University of Montana. And uh, these mass extinctions are extremely well uh, exposed in Montana. Um, and uh, and you know, we've, we've studied them in detail and they appear to be uh, related to climate change. Um, no big shock there uh, that we can see recorded in the rock record as well as in the geochemistry. Okay, Jim. All right, as we go into the late Paleozoic, uh, one of the most important of all rock units in Montana was deposited, the Madison Group Limestone. Uh, well, why is that one so important? Because it's an exceedingly um, resistant, rock unit and as a result, especially in our desert uh, climate, Montana. And so being widespread and being very resistant to erosion, um, it forms many of the important landmarks in the state of Montana. Uh, Beaverhead Rock near Dillon, uh, Lewis's Lookout uh, at the Three Forks of the Missouri, uh, Gates of the Mountains uh, outside of Helena, uh, of course, the great walls of Madison Limestone entering the Sun River Canyon. Uh, if you've ever had a chance, or, or, or if you've not had a chance, rather, you got to see it. Mission Canyon and the Little Rocky Mountains, uh, spectacular exposures, exposures of Madison Limestone in, in uh, central Montana. And of course, need I say, the Smith River. Um, the float of a lifetime, right, that we all put in for and hope we get a permit uh, is largely through Madison Group limestones. And uh, if you want to collect, uh, and I pointed this out in the book, come down to Dillon because there's exposures along Clark Canyon Reservoir where you can collect. And it's the picture in the upper right is uh, a, an actual sample of Madison limestone with brachiopods and rugose corals and crinoids with the five star shape on the inside. Spectacular stuff. And if you're lucky, you might even you might even find a trilobite and everybody wants to find a trilobite. So uh, come up, come down to Dillon and uh, do some fossil collecting along the banks of the uh, the reservoir, and in particular at the spillway, or if anybody's interested, uh, just email me. I'm happy to share the locale. Great place to take kids. They weather right out of the rock uh, hole, so the kids can just pick them up off the ground, whole fossils. Uh, really spectacular. All right. Well, there was karst development on the Madison. And the best place to see that is in Bighorn Canyon. If you've never been there in central Montana, you have got to go. It's the Grand Canyon of Montana, and it is off the charts spectacular. And uh, the Madison is uh, really well exposed in uh, the Bighorn River Canyon. Uh, and it uh, it has karst development on the top of it. So there was exposure um, and that exposure is uh, surface created karst or dissolution of the limestone. And it colored that karst red um, because the overlying unit above it is the Amston formation. And it's possible that there was also concentration of red oxidized clay minerals out of the limestones uh, in these areas of karst development, um, as you dissolve the, the calcite and you leave behind the clay minerals and concentrate them, uh, that's another possibility. Um, jury is, you know, uh, out on that. All right. By the time you get into the Pennsylvanian, you're in coastal sand dune deposits of what's called the quadrant formation. And uh, by Permian time, we have 
phosphate deposits uh, from upwelling on a shallow shelf called the uh, uh, Phosphoria Formation. And there's a picture of it in the lower right. And uh, most people would look at that and say, that's nice. In fact, Don Hyman asked, <laughs> said to me, that's a picture of nice. And I said, no, that's a picture of phosphorite um, in the Phosphoria Formation. So that white stuff you see in there is one of our most important economic minerals on earth. It is fertilizer and being mined extensively to the south of us in Idaho uh, for that phosphate in the phosphory formation. And we've got it here in Montana. It's, there's a spectacular exposure of it on, on a outcrop on I-15 south of Dillon called Daily Spur, if you're interested. Okay, Jim. All right, early Mesozoic, okay? This is where everything starts to really happen in Montana, right? We have another supercontinent, Pangaea, that forms at the end of the Permian. All continents coming together, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean starts breaking up. Um, and uh, the last gasps of shallow seas do occur in Montana. Uh, they, they are called the Dinwiddie Formation and the Chugwater Formation. Uh, the Dinwoody, uh, which is in the western part of the state, is uh, a, a really spectacular mixed limestone and non-limestone siliciclastic deposit, um, and a beautiful hummocky cross stratification. It's a wonderful shelf deposit, really storm dominated, loaded with brachiopods, um, early ammonites, ammonoids and uh, snails and a variety of other fossils. And these are things that survived the great Permian uh, mass extinction event, the great dying at the end of the Permian. Uh, we don't actually have the Permo-Triassic boundary here, uh, but uh, we do have these recovery faunas that are about mm, maybe eight, nine, 10 million years post extinction. Um, okay, so uh, as Pangaea breaks up, the Atlantic Ocean is opening up, and as you open up the Atlantic Ocean, it's pushing North America into the Pacific Ocean floor, what's called the Fairlawn Plate, and that causes subduction. So this, the Fairlawn Plate being heavy ocean floor then subducts underneath North America, starting for sure in Jurassic time, um, because we can see evidence of westerly derived sediments uh, during Jurassic time. Uh, the Morrison Formation being, you know, one of the most uh, prominent. Uh, and there's also some, you know, some last gasps of oceanic deposits as well. You can see these beautiful pentacrinoids, the star-shaped crinoids uh, in the photo on the left, courtesy of Marley Miller, uh, in the Swift. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's in the Swift, in the Ellis Group, Jurassic Ellis Group. Um, and then uh, that, that bone on the right, I collected that. Uh, that is the toe bone from a juvenile sauropod. So no pun intended, that's a little foot from little foot. For those that learned your paleontology from land before time. And I know you all learned your paleontology from land before time. And we now actually have 11 juvenile sauropods in the Morrison Formation north of Dillon. I won't tell you where. And uh, they probably died trying to cross the swollen river. So it's a great tragedy, little foot, uh, multiple little foots dead in the Morrison Formation of Montana. For a long time, Morrison didn't yield much for dinosaur fossils in Montana. Of course, it's spectacularly rich uh, just south of us in Bernal, Utah, where Dinosaur National Monument is in the Jurassic Morrison <laughs> Formation. But uh, we now know better, and we now know that the Morrison has some spectacular Jurassic dinosaurs in it here in Montana. All right, so as the, four line, four, as the fair line plates of ducks below North America, mountains begin to rise in the west. The Morrison formation are stream deposits that are west to east uh, flowing into what's called the Foreland Basin, which is the basin to the east of the volcanic arc and the fold and thrust belt that are forming by this plate collision between the Fairlawn plate and the North American plate. Okay, Jim. All right, there it is on the left. So uh, the Fairlawn plates ducting uh, below the 
uh, overriding North American plate, descending, generating magmas. Um, those magmas, of course, form the Idaho batholith in uh, Idaho and in westernmost Montana. And uh, the sedimentary cover that was above the, again, quote, basement rocks, uh, uh, the old Archean and Paleoproterozoic metamorphic rocks, it becomes translated or moved from west to east along thrust faults, and it becomes compressed uh, through folding. And uh, it builds up a big area of thrust faults and folded rocks that we call the fold and thrust belt uh, here in Montana. And then as you go further to the east into central and eastern, Mon well, in western and central and eastern Montana, you're into the Foreland Basin. And at times, sea level inundated that. And we call that the Western, and seaway, western Interior Seaway. And you can see all that in that diagram on the lower left. On the right, is the Sun River Canyon. If you've never been, again, gotta go uh, outside of Augusta and you can see the Paleozoic rocks and the skyline, Madison limestone and others thrusted over the Mesozoic uh, Foreland Basin deposits in the foreground, a person walking down the trail for scale. And uh, so that's a big thrust fault that has placed older rocks over younger rocks for the non-geologists. And so by definition, that's, and its angle of the fault is a thrust fault. Um, and that's from this compression of, uh, of the plate collision uh, starting in Jurassic time. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the next slide. All right, so, there was intrusion of liquid rock at this time as well, right? It's a volcanic arc generated by the subducting slab. The subducting slab is, descends, it releases uh, fluids, water that lowers the melting temperature of the mantle and we generate magmas that rise up. And uh, those magmas were centered on the Idaho batholith on the Montana uh, Idaho border, that's the big Cretaceous intrusive shown in red on the map south of Missoula on the Montana-Idaho border out in the Bitterroot Valley, in the Bitterroot Mountains. And, uh, but you can see that there's all these red dots going to the east as well. And one of the things that we've learned over time um, in mapping these rocks and, and uh, looking at them in detail is that many of them uh, may actually have been sourced uh, in the Idaho batholith and uh, squirted off, if you will, uh, or slid off to the east. Um, let's give, for example, McCartney Mountain. North of Dillon is a small intrusion called McCartney Mountain. And uh, Tom Calique, uh at Rocky uh, did PhD work on it. And there's a graphic on the left below the writing and it shows in pink, this magma moving up a thrust ramp and then placing uh, on the top of that thrust ramp and forming an intrusion uh, and then injecting sills off to the right, which is off to the east. So we now have pretty good evidence that a lot of these intrusions came in along faults. Um, the source of those magmas, part of maybe larger sources of magma off to the west, like the Idaho batholith, and translated to the east along these fault systems as, I guess, zones of porosity and permeability, and in placed along them. Um, so in many ways, they're kind of really more like lacoliths. Um, they're flat bottomed and uh, arch topped uh, for those that you know, know that term. Uh, to the right is a wonderful picture of a place to see granite uh, of the uh, uh, very large boulder batholith, which extends from just north of Dillon all the way to Helena uh, through the Butte area. That's that big swath of red on the map. And this is, of course, the Humbug Spires on the right with the spectacular fins that the rock climbers like of the uh, granitic rocks of the Boulder Batholith, um, a place worth seeing and a great place to see uh, the one of the you know, granites of, the, uh, of, the, of this time period between 90 and 70 million years ago, which was the main period of intrusion during the Cretaceous. 
Okay, some of these magmas actually did erupt onto the surface. Might have been wondering, were there volcanoes? Um, surprisingly, not in a lot of places, uh, but definitely they were there. You can see them in the orange color on the map, Cretaceous extrusive rocks. So these are volcanic rocks. Of course, most famous is the Elkhorn Mountain Volcanics in the Butte area and up in the Helena area and Boulder area. Um, and uh, the Slide Rock Mount Volcano out there by Livingston, uh, which is that one to the east of Bozeman on the map. Um, so yes, there were eruptions uh, at this time. And in fact, actually, uh, there's some really spectacular uh, fossil finds in the Foreland Basin that uh, are animals that maybe died uh, during volcanic eruptions and were inundated by ash and then buried in that ash and preserved. And there's some fossil forests uh, out in central Montana that are buried in ash um, from uh, probably Elkhorn uh, Mountain Volcanics. So uh, lots of uh, evidence for uh, the volcanic component. Um, this is also a time when many of our uh, metals form through a process called metasomatism, fluid migration out of these magmas into the surrounding rocks in what's called a contact metamorphic zone. And those fluids are interacting with those rocks that are being baked and forming new minerals. Uh, the picture on the left with the penny is of a uh, grossularite. Uh, it's a rock called grossularite, and it has tungsten in it, uh, which was once mined for filaments and light bulbs uh, in a mine above uh, Browns Lake in the Pioneer Mountains to the west of Dillon. Okay, Jim. All right. And then the sliders. So some of the granite movement from uh, west to east is not creeping along faults. Uh, necessarily as fluid creeping along the fault, but might have actually moved uh, as a block detaching. So what you see in that diagram on the bottom, um, and this is the work of Don Hyman, you know, more than just about any other human being uh, that I know of. Um, Dave Foster uh, has done a lot of work on this as well. And Dave was a student of Don Hyman's. The Idaho Batholith being an area of hot, Granitic magma during uh, Cretaceous times rising. Um, the crust is bulging under all that heat. And uh, the granite is uh, mushy and, and weak. And as a result, that weak magma can lubricate slides or detachments of blocks of rock off of this rising welt of land that you see that's you know, labeled the Bitterroot Mountains. That's where we see that today. The Bitterroot Mountains that we see today are more complex than just this, but this is the beginnings of them. So as that rises up you know, to the left, then the sapphire block detached off of that, and there's a myelinite, um, which are just rocks that have been sheared and stretched out. Some of them are brittle uh, and, and form breaches. Uh, and are not myelinites, um, but are fault breaches, but much of it's myelinite. And uh, so the detachment created these shear zones and the sheared rock or myelinite is really well exposed in the front range of the Bitterroot Mountains. That's the picture on the right. Uh, and you can see that kind of layering in the rock uh, and the arrow is showing that layering in the rock. And uh, that is the detachment, that's the myelinite, the shear zone that detached the sapphire block off of the rising uh, bitterroot dome, it's called. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, there's some debate over uh, you know, when all this happened. Don Hyman is adamant that there was movement during Cretaceous time uh, of the sapphire block off of the Idaho batholith off the bitterroot dome. Um, along that myelinite. And then uh, recent work, largely done by Dave Foster and others, shows that it moved again in Eocene time uh, due to extension. Um, and uh, there's a lot of brittle, or brittle uh, uh, 
Breccia uh, associated with movement at that time. Um, for those who know the geology well, the, the Spokane Dome up in Northwest Montana is a similar detachment zone to the uh, uh, Bitterroot Dome and Sapphire Block, or if you will, the Bitterroot Milanite Detachment or Bitterroot Detachment, whatever you want to call it. There's 50 names for the same thing. It's geology. Okay, Jim. <laughs> All right, off to the east. The eastern part of the state is the best. It's just spectacular. You have to spend time in it. You can't appreciate it on the interstates. Um, at this time, it, it has the Western Interior Seaway deposits. And it's deposition of marine and non-marine sedimentary rocks, depending on sea level in the, in the uh, Western Interior Seaway. Dinosaurs lived along the margins of that seaway. Um, including uh, uh, this baby Myasaurus uh, Myasaur, uh, dinosaur that was reconstructed by Jack Horner. Uh, that's a cast that's on display in Bynum at the museum up there, which is a great little museum, really a, a wonderful museum. But Jack did that. Um, the, the original, I think, is at the Museum of the Rockies presently. Um, in the seaway were, of course, swimming reptiles and ammonites and oysters. And so for those of you who like to collect and maybe have collected these marine organisms along the shores of, of Fort Peck Reservoir, those are in units like the Bear Paw Shale, a Cretaceous shale that uh, is filled with marine animals because it was a marine deposit in the Cretaceous interior seaway or the um, Western Interior Seaway. And, and the KT boundary, the, the famous dinosaur extinction boundary, is exposed throughout central and eastern Montana. Uh, the picture on the right is my colleague Sheila Roberts with her hand very close to the KT boundary or the KPG boundary, whatever you like these days, uh, tomato, tomato. And uh, she's, her body is on the Hell Creek Formation, which is Cretaceous. And above that coal seam uh, is the Fort Union Formation. And the, uh, between the two is the KT boundary. And uh, when uh, dinosaurs and lots of other animals went extinct. And it's exposed all over the place in eastern Montana. But this is at Makoshika State Park out of Glendive, which is a bucket list geology stop. You have to go. OK, Jim. All right. As we go from the Mesozoic into the Cenozoic, uh, uh, we see a change in the angle of the subduction zone. The, there's the Farallon plate in the upper uh, during Cretaceous time at a steep angle. And as we get towards the end of the Cretaceous, the angle shallows out on the subduction of the Farallon plate. And as a result of that shallowing out, uh, uh, we get blocks of basement um, that are lifted up as well as the overlying sedimentary rocks. And so the picture in the middle show, is a cartoon of, of say the Beartooth uplift, which is uh, not the mountain range we see today, but the uplift, uh, when I'm using the word uplift, I mean the uplift that occurred at this time, what we call the Laramide orogeny from the, in the, the Cretaceous into the earliest tertiary. And so what you can see is there's a red fault. Notice it's got a fairly shallow angle, but it has splays that are steep. This is one thing we've learned about Laramide faults. They have both these components, steep faults and shallow faults. Uh, but the big ones tend to be shallower than we used to think. And they bring up basement to the surface. And the Paleozoic Mesozoic section um, got draped over the rising block of basement. And uh, as it eroded things away, it left palisades, which is uh, the picture on the far right, upper right, um, which are rocks that were tilted along the edge of these uplifts. Uh, that happens to be the Bighorn, Ordovician Bighorn Dolomite uh, near Red Lodge, uh, tilted up on edge forming palisades or steeply dipping fins of rocks that were once draped over the basement um, of the Beartooth uplift. And you can see the more horizontal rocks on Beartooth Butte, which is between Cook City 
and Red Lodge up on top of the Beartooth Plateau. Okay, um, uplift of the Beartooth, Beartooth Plateau ended up into the tertiary. Uh, we know this because uh, there are deposits in the Fort Union Formation, they actually have their own names, of conglomerates shed off the Beartooth block and then overridden by the faults. Um, and we see paleo seismites um, showing there were earthquakes going on uh, in these rocks, where you had contorted beds and plastic dikes and all kinds of cool stuff related to earthquake activity. And those streams coming off of these laramide blocks drained to the east, as you can see in the map, um, and uh, made rivers and swamps across eastern Montana that became the gigantic coal deposits that we see at places like Coal Strip. And uh, you can also see that the interior ocean has retreated out uh, what we call the Cannonball Sea, and it's in North Dakota by this time, and Montana is now free of oceanic deposition, and we'll never see it again. Jim? One sec. Uh, I just want to chime in real quick, um, just so we have some time for questions, if anybody has them. The, the Zoom meeting will self-implode at about 5.20. Um, okay. If it would be possible to get some final thoughts in, in the next couple of minutes, and then we can have people ask questions, if that's... Yep, I'll okay. go as quick as I can. Great. <laughs> next slide. Okay. So uh, during, the, during the Eocene, there's a period of balkanism from this shallow subduction. Just leave it at that. Some of that is uh, felsic volcanism, uh, the Chalice Volcanics in Idaho, the Dillon Volcanics in our area, uh, Lowland Creek Volcanics up by Butte, um, and then of course the Absorca Volcanics in the Yellowstone Plateau region. And then the, the, the uh, Alcalic province of, Easter, of central Montana, rather the central Montana Alcalic province, uh, there's a picture uh, there of Square Butte in the lower right, and uh, that is Shonkanite, uh, a funky alkalic igneous rock uh, that uh, came in on along a dike, which is shown with that arrow, uh, and then rolled over and intruded in and formed a silt. Uh, and so many of the igneous rocks you see in central Montana are these funky uh, alkalic igneous rocks, Shonkanite, uh, a, a common one, um, cyanite, etc. Uh, okay, next slide, Jim. All right. Um, also, extension starts during this time. The Anaconda Metamorphic Core Complex is a, uh, has a myelinite, and it's the detachment of the boulder batholith to the right as extension starts. So, you know, some of the thoughts on this thickening of the crust during the, the compression that occurred as the Fairlawn Plate is gliding with North America. As the Fairlawn Plate moves to the east, because there is accretion of terrains onto Western North America. It takes the bulldozers back and off. And as the bulldozer backs off, the over thickened lithosphere falls apart and begins to extend. And uh, so this is the beginning of extension. Jim, next. That extension continues through a period of time, 40 to 23. Um, there's a definable zone uh, that we, uh, of extension. You can see in the map on the right. Uh, that deposited the Renova Formation, which is a spectacular unit filled with fossil mammals, uh, insect fossils, plant fossils, and so on in a non-marine setting, streams and lakes in these valleys of the, of the forming basin and range. Okay, next. Then uh, in early Neogene time, Yellowstone starts having its influence on the area and ashes come pouring into Montana down the river drainages of the ancestral Missouri from the various calderas along the track of the Yellowstone hotspot. Uh, this spectacular ash on the right is uh, in the East Fork of the Blacktail Deer Creek in the Dillon area. And we can trace these uh, across mountain ranges that we know weren't there at the time. So the ancestral Missouri River was a Northeast flowing river system and topography has been uplifted in its path since. Next. Here's that topography. Those red lines in Southwest Montana are Northwest trending normal faults adjacent to the Snake River Plain that started forming about 4 million years ago and uh, stopped the 
pathway of the Missouri River as it had been in, in uh, uh, the Six Mile Creek time, the, the Neogene. Uh, a good place to see it is a Timber Hill. This is a Marley Miller, Miller photo down in the lower right. And what you're looking at is a basalt flow that can be traced to the Heisey volcanic field in Idaho. And here it is outside of Dillon. Um, it flowed about 100 miles to the north, and it's cut by the Sweetwater Fault, which is a less than 4 million year old uh, normal fault uh, that is a part of this most recent extension in southwest Montana related to the passage of the Yellowstone hotspot, relative passage of it to the northeast. Okay, Jim. There are these flat surfaces all over the place in Montana. These are pediments. Uh, during the Pliocene, the late Neogene, the, the, the latest part of the Neogene, what we call the Pliocene epoch, um, there was desert-like conditions and it eroded the mountains back um, and formed these flat surfaces that, that progress, you know, that are inclined up to the mountains um, called uh, uh, pediment surfaces. And then those were dissected in the last couple of million years to form the topography, leaving them high, uh, as you see there in that photograph. Okay, next. We're almost there. Yellowstone, of course. Yellowstone Plateau Volcanic Field has had three mega eruptions in the last two million years. One at 2.1, what's called Huckleberry Ridge. One at 1.3, that's the Mesa Falls. And one at 0.639, 639,000 years ago, that's the Lava Creek. And we have Huckleberry Ridge Tuff in Montana. So this gigantic pyroclastic blow uh, that came from that mega eruption came into Montana and flowed down uh, existing basins of the Basin and Range, uh, including uh, the Madison Valley, uh, where you can see it uh, along the Madison River. Okay, next. Pleistocene is about glaciation, right? So we had uh, the Corriere and Ice Sheet in northwestern Montana. The Laurentide Ice Sheet came down across uh, central and eastern Montana. And then we had Alpine Ice Sheets across the mountains of western Montana. Um, and uh, the two major advances are the Bull Lake and the Pinedale. They're roughly equivalent to Illinois and late Wisconsin using the terminology of the Midwest. Uh, that older one, about 136,000 years ago, was the max of the advance. The Pinedale advance is between 19 and 15,000 years ago. Okay, next. I swear I'm almost done. The lakes, Glacial Lake Missoula, of course, but there were these other glacial lakes across the Laurentide Ice Sheet in central Montana. Nobody knows about these. Um, glacial Lake Great Falls, Glacial Lake Mussel Shell, Glacial Lake Jordan, cool stuff and definitely worth looking at. Um, there's a, a place called Shonk and Sag in, uh, outside of the Highwood Mountains in eastern central Montana uh, that was a big catastrophic blowout of Great Glacial Lake Great Falls, not unlike the big blowout on Glacial Lake Missoula that generated the gigantic ripples in northwestern Montana that you see in, in Dave Bennett's photograph on the right. Okay, next. The terraces. If you've ever been down the Madison River, you'd notice that, by God, the, the, the Madison River has more terraces uh, than you've ever seen in your life. And it indicates, of course, that the, the valleys are, you know, going up, if you will, and the river is cutting down. There's a lot of mechanisms I don't have time to go into that result in these, but what you're looking at are places where the river used to be. That's where the terraces are, and it shows us that the river's cutting down, whatever the mechanism is. And you see this all across Montana, especially western Montana, but also in central Montana as well. Uh-oh. Okay, next one, please. All right, people. People showed up probably going back 14,000 years ago, based on a site down here in the Dillon area. Um, and uh, the reason why I like to put it in is because that picture of folded and thrust vaulted rocks on the right, there's an overturned anti or syncline, and it says the word buffalo jump. There's a buffalo jump there where native people actually used a north plunging syncline, which closes to the south, which is going down in the photo, um, creating a natural funnel 
and a drop off where the bison would go off that edge, break their legs, and then they could finish them off and process them. Um, spectacular example of a combination of geology and the use of that geology by native people. Okay, next. Metal mining, you guys all know about that. Uh, the placer deposits in Alder Gulch are some of the great placer deposits anywhere in the world. Um, they literally turned that stream bed inside out uh, using uh, various techniques, including dredge, uh, bucket dredge mining, like you see in the photo on the left. And of course, there's been uh, um, tons of underground mining. Many of these deposits are were formed during Cretaceous time with the intrusions of the granites, uh, forming scarn minerals that have been uh, uh, tapped for uh, you know, various economic purposes. Okay, next. Earthquakes. We have earthquakes in Montana. We're pulling apart, and that extension results in quakes. Of course, the famous Quake Lake in 1959 was the largest recorded earthquake. Uh, in uh, the Rocky Mountain region at a seven and a half on the Richter. And uh, we had one in Dillon in 2005 that uh, was a five and a half. Um, that's my neighbor's chimney um, after uh, that earthquake. Um, earthquakes are great unless you own property. Okay, next. <laughs> and our future. Our future is about climate change, cleanup, and development. Uh, that picture on the left is uh, copper water on a slicken on the upper Clark Fork River, dead moth for scale, I swear to God, I did not put it there, it was there. Um, on the right is the Grinnell Glacier going away. Uh, glaciers are disappearing and uh, our climate is changing. And so we've got cleanup and climate change to deal with. And of course we've got development as uh, you know, uh, some of the hottest real estate markets in the United States are now in Bozeman and Missoula and elsewhere. Okay, I think I did it. Is that the last one? That should be the last yeah, one. Yeah, that's the last one. Great. All right. A lot of material to cover. Thanks for everything. We, we still have about eight more minutes before the Zoom meeting turns back into a pumpkin. Um, hey. But if anyone has any questions, now's the time. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be so, it's just all 6,000 years old. Yeah. <laughs> Call it good. Let's see. Talk to the governor. He'll tell I have a question about. if I could jump in. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and I teach high school earth science in Colorado, and I've never been to Montana. And Hi, I'm Stephanie. I am taking my family to Bozeman for a week in July. Do you have any advice for taking my 12 and 15 year old daughters out to see some geology and convince them that geology is cool? Like where should I yeah. go around what, Bozeman? What, what, what time of year? July. July. Okay. Well, first of all, I got to go down the, uh, go over the hill to Livingston and go down the Paradise Valley to Yellowstone. Of course. Okay. And get a copy of Roadside Geology of Yellowstone. You can buy it for $24. Oh, uh, I, I have it. I have the whole, all the Western states. I have them all. Okay. Get the new one in color uh, okay. and follow the road guide down to Gardner. That is, the kids will love it. Um, but uh, real close to Bozeman, you can go up Highlight Canyon and see some volcanic rocks that have uh, fossil wood in them. Uh, just ask anybody, they'll tell you how to get up Highlight Canyon, no problem. Uh, and another neat place to go, especially in July, take them to a place called Fairy Lake, which is above, uh, it's, in the, it's in the Bridger Range. And you go around the east side of the Bridger Range and there's a good dirt road and you can camp at Fairy Lake if you can get a spot these days. And from there, you can take a trail and you can hike up to the crest of the range. And you have this spectacular view of all the basin range topography, the Gallatin Valley and so on. And the rocks underneath your feet are loaded with fossils. And it's on National Forest Service property and they're invertebrate fossils so the kids can collect them. Oh, that's fantastic, thank you. Okay, so do that. I Don't will. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? It's a lot. I, I got a question for you. Okay, yes. I just put it in the text box, but the- Oh, sorry. That's fine. The uh, um, a friend of mine and I were, were over here at MSU talking about the, the terraces on the Madison that you showed a picture of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that was valley infill during the Pleistocene? 
and then yes. cut down through the Holocene? Absolutely. Yes. That's what I thought. But yeah. but then my friend Tony Hartshorn, if he's still on, was pointing out that the Palisades, there's some bedrock in the middle of all that. There is. Uh, the Palisades are Huckleberry Ridge Tough at 2.1. Okay. 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 All right. um, but there's no question about it. A lot of the terraces are, they're built, they're built terraces, right? They're not cut terraces. Um, and they're made up of outwash. Yeah, that's what I thought. You yeah. need, you, we need to have your contact so we can solve beer bets. Yeah, as, you bet. As needed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, the real argument is over. I'm not saying that, that you know, there aren't examples uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, non-Holocene cutting. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's just boatloads of sediment raining out of Yellowstone uh, region, right, uh, during that time period. And so uh, you've got Till and Outwash filling in like the Paradise Valley, uh, Madison Valley. And, and so the time of deposition is during the Pleistocene when you've got a, you know, gigantic flood of sediment coming in. And then uh, that area is being thermally expanded up around the hot spot, which is you know increasing gradient and allowing Holocene streams to cut through it and create terraces. Um, you know that that's that's what I think is likely the mechanism. But there are others, right? Uh, you know the baseline has the baseline changed, uh, and is that driving it? In other words, are changes in sea level? Uh, driving it because when sea level drops, rivers cut down. When sea level rises, rivers back up and don't. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Yep. And there's also uh, great drumlins and moraines in the Paradise Valley that are. Yes, incredible. Yeah, the uh, the glacier stopped uh, around Prey, uh, near Prey, Montana, um, and you can see the till uh, there, and then it goes to Outwash from there to the north. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think we have time for one more short question. Uh, if anyone, well, I'll uh, I'll pipe up, Rob. Um, I'm really curious about what it's like to try to write a book where you clearly need to um, compress a lot of information into a short space. I'm just curious about how you worked with editors, or if you and your co-author just traded back and forth. Yeah, great question. Okay, so. Um, the first thing to do is to make sure that you've got a good close friend that can serve as a psychiatrist. So Marley Miller, who's on this call, was my psychiatrist uh, during the writing of Roadside Geology. And uh, <laughs> um, so that aside, Don and I did a lot of that. So we, we were lucky in that I think that Don and I had similar writing styles. I think that we had a little bit of debate over the depth you know, as you can probably tell from, I mean, I go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, Don is more to the point. Um, and so I wanted to put in more, 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 more. And in fact, the book was 200 pages over limit when we turned it in. So it got heavily edit, edited by an incredible editor, Jen Carey at Mountain Press who I didn't mention earlier and should have mentioned is absolutely essential to the construction of this book. So Don and I are just a piece of the team, but Chelsea Feeney made the book look good. Contributors of photographs like Marley and others made it look good. <laughs> People I talked to like Tom Calake and many others, Dick Gibson over and over and over again, Dick Berg at the Bureau uh, many times about sapphires and other things. These people were essential, you know, to helping me distill down all this detail to something that, you know, could work in a book like this. And I was still 200, you know, Don and I were still 200 pages over. And I, I take the blame for that. Um, so then Jen Carey got a hold of it. And she uh, did a masterful job of cutting out the fluff uh, and not getting rid of the content. Um, well, Rob, I think the I think it's going to cut out in a few seconds. So I just okay. I just want to say final thanks again. Thanks for everyone for joining. And Rob, thanks for your talk. You bet. Uh, yeah. Anybody that wants to reach me, you can reach me via email. Uh, I have a Facebook site. Um, 
uh, that's probably easy enough to find. I'm happy to interact that way. And there, we have a Facebook site called Montana Geology. You should look it up and join it. Um, it's a great way to continue to learn about Montana geology. There's wonderful stuff posted by lots of people across the state in, in uh, Montana's ge geological community and, and lay people who are just curious about something that they've found. Um, usually uh, concretions that they think are dinosaur eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, some great stuff shows up. So uh, you can reach me. My campus email is my name, rob.thomas and at umwestern, uh, U-M as in mother, western, dot edu. Okay, rob.thomas at umwestern, dot edu. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you or the Facebook sites. That's another great place to get a hold of me. Awesome. And I think I'm, I'm going to, am I, am I going to lose the chats, Jim? I can't look at those. Um, I, I don't know. Those might be saved with the recording. Um, I'll find out when I'm done. Okay. So All right. uh, but I'm happy to go through time. those chats and try to answer questions as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, sure they would very much appreciate that. Yeah. I just don't have access to them on my end now. Right. Right. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks again, Rob. Um, You're welcome. And we'll uh, see everyone next time at our at our next seminar. Uh, everyone, okay. take care.